Hi, everybody. This is Matt Finch. Uh, Matt Finch is uh, Uncle Matt's D&D uh, &D neighborhood. And um, today we're, we're following up on our series of some of the um, early campaign worlds um, that were coming out in the early days uh, around Dungeons and Dragons. And we've covered uh, Tecumel. We have covered uh, Arduin. Now we're going to uh, go after one of the other uh, extremely interesting worlds that was developed uh, during that period of time, uh, which was the Sky Realms of Jorun. The world, the name of the world is Jorun. And I have here uh, Joe Adams. Say hello to everyone. Hi there, everyone. And uh, Steve, say hello to everyone. Steve hello. Devaney. Um, and uh, both of them are icons on the screen um, to protect the innocent and because they don't have cameras. So uh, we are primitive. So we're going to go ahead and uh, and go with that. So, um, guys, the first question um, I think a lot my my viewer base tends to be people you know who are in their forties and older. So a lot of people have seen uh, the advertisements for Jorun, you know, in uh, in Dragon Magazine and and so forth during the day, um, but may not be familiar with it. So, um, Joe, why don't you start and just give people an idea of um, what is Jorun? Jareen is set on a lost colony from an Earth-based colony that arrived and discovered that there were aliens living there. And I, when I say aliens, <clears throat> I'm not just talking about not from Earth. There's a native race, but there are other aliens that have been there too. And they've been on the planet for many hundred years, and somehow they've learned to live together. They have tension. But when the Earthmen arrive, we suddenly lose contact with Earth, and it goes into a major war between the natives and all of the aliens and all of the Earth-based population. And our story takes place 3,600 years later. That's where we enter the world. Steve, what would you add to that in terms of the description of the world? Why was it called Sky Realms? <laughs> well, um there are chunks of of land, vegeta vegeta vegetation and land that float around in the sky, <clears throat> um, and that's due to these sort of these uh, these crystals that grow in the earth. Um, but I would what I would add actually is uh, heavy metal magazine is it it really wrong with that sort of uh, feeling for me when it came out. If the old folks remember the old Yes uh, album covers that yeah. had the Roger Dean art and yes. those mountains that float in the sky, that kind yeah, of thing. Exactly. So um, give a, now one of the things that I'm going to uh, sort of head toward is um, there, you know, there is a new uh, edition of D&D that's been of Dungeons and Dragons. It's been very, very popular, the fifth edition of it. And um, a lot of the people who play that are looking around at, at different worlds. And so um, one of the things, Steve, that you're uh, working on is a, a D20 version of the Jorian rules. Um, you're working on it. It sounds like it's, it's not at the, at, the, at the front burner of your desk right now, but talk a little bit about that. Okay, so um, I am essentially trying to recreate what Andrew Leaker and um, and uh, Miles Teves and Amy, as well, I guess their sister, created in high in high school, uh, which is uh, the intent. Uh, I mean, the intent of what they created, what they created in high school, but um, recreate it with the with the die twenty rules using a uh, the D20 here, the Hero D20 SRD um, that Mutants and Masterminds is based upon. For for those of you who are interested in SRDs, and um, it's a point-based system. It's not level-based, but it allows for a lot of the unique uh, powers that Jeroen has uh, to be represented. And, and so, uh, so Joe. Now, let me swing back since we're we're focusing mainly on uh, the world setting uh, here. But in terms of the history of when the game came out, it had a, a first edition that came out that was one booklet, and then the uh, the very uh, famous second edition, which was a boxed set, came out. That's the right? one that caught everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they caught yeah. me. The first edition was actually done, like Steve said, these two boys in high school that did Jeroen as an English class project. 
they had a very uh, advanced teacher that encouraged them to use their imagination. They had based it on metaphor, Metamorphosis Alpha, which mm -hmm. was one of the original D&D settings. And they then, when they did the first book, uh, they did the very best they could do. You know, they were teenagers, and they actually did a very decent job. It's very hard to find that first edition in print. You can find it if you go to archive.org and look up RPG SOJ. A lot of things will come up, including the first edition. Mm -hmm. They came out with one supplement for first edition, which was called Lair of the Moth and Kauji. And the, the Moth and Kauji became the foundation of Alien Logic, which was the computer game version, mm -hmm. which came out in the late 90s. Uh, the second edition is where Amy came in. She already had worked for an outfit called Chessex and had experience putting together packaging and box sets and all that. She knew what to do. She decided on the typefaces. She decided on the color of paper to be used, how it would be presented. It was a box set with three primary booklets, one campaign booklet, and extra character sheets and all kinds of really cool stuff. The second edition box set was what caught everyone, including me. I first found it on the used game shelf at Gamescape in San Francisco, and they just had one one cover showing. They had uh, the first three books, the Colobasandra module, the companion books, Companion Earth Tech, Companion Ardoth, Companion Birdoth, and the one that had come out at Gen Con playing the Iskan races, all bound into one plastic wrapped package. And I couldn't get that out of the store fast enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was in that. It was a gorgeous cover. Miles Teves was able to paint on a Renaissance, you know, level artist skill when he was 19. Yeah. Miles is in his 40s now, and he's created some of the icons of entertainment for the last 25 years, last 30 years. He created the devil from Legend, the Tim Curry devil with the gigantic horns on the side of his head. Did he really? He designed RoboCop. Mm -hmm. he des his first professional gig with Stan Winston was designing the skin for the dinosaurs in the first Jurassic Park. Uh, Galaxy Quest is all his. It's Earth Tech gone nuts from Jeroen with the same kind of aliens from Jeroen. Uh -huh. He started stealing from Jeroen. He started stealing from himself to put in the movies. Yeah, um, John Carter. John, John, John Carter. Carter of Mars. Uh, he also had, um, excuse me, I'm getting a, uh, I'm getting a notice from my phone. Uh, he designed aliens for a film called Explorers with River Phoenix and a really good crew. But one of the aliens is a thriddle from Jeroen. Mm -hmm. If you go later, you start seeing that the aliens from the fourth Indiana Jones movies are Ramion from Jeroen. If you look at AI, which Miles also designed, the aliens there are Shanta. They're energy constructs, which is how he always saw Shanta, but didn't know how to create that without four-dimensional computer graphics. But he does now. And then he turned around and did really gritty stuff, which is the thing I loved about Jeroen, is it looked like it had been lived in. Yeah. He designed Schindler's List and Amistad. As a graphic designer for the movies, he's done some really serious work. But it was his artwork that got everyone into it, and they almost looked at the world as a secondary thought. And I was fascinated by this entire planet that could be explored. And to me, that was the reason to get into gaming is go new places, you know, get the treasure, save the girl, be the good guy and all that stuff. But yeah. I love that. And um, so second edition came out, got people, had supplements, the Companion Bird Off, Companion Yard Off, uh, Earth Tech. And then they started going to Gen Con. They did Shantas of Jeroen playing the Iskin races. And then third edition came out and third edition was published by Chessex which are the people that taught Amy Leaker how to do the design she did for second edition. Unfortunately, they didn't know how to put out books. They knew how to put out dice and, and yeah, I was about to say they're a dice company. Yeah. Book, book covers and stuff like that. But what they did is when they put it out, they, they took David Ackerman, who was the original editor and put him under pressure that they had to meet a deadline and they weren't doing the proofreading. 
They wound up publishing the actual book with no instructions on how to generate a character, uh, how to come up with hit points. How do you kill it? And you can stand there and beat a bigger all day long and it's just going to laugh at you because yeah. you, it it, you can't kill it. Yeah. So they within the first couple of weeks, I, I got my first copy from Games of Berkeley when it came out. And within 48 hours, I was on the phone complaining about problems with the third edition. David knew about it. And my first encounter with David was him getting very upset with me. Well, you think you're so smart? <laughs> Write up a proposal and fix it. Well, he didn't know that I've already been in publishing. I have a lot of plays produced. And, you know, I've worked in Hollywood for quite a while. And I know how to do that. So I did a proposal. By the time I called up, he was gone. And Janice Sellers was in charge. Mm -hmm. And so I gave her my proposal. And she looked at it and said, okay, we'll go ahead and write it and bring it in. I said, no, that's not how writing works. You know, you pay <laughs> me. And then I, you know, we come up with it so much on uh, signing, so much on delivery and so much on publication. Oh, we don't do that. Well, bye. Right. <laughs> and I give her credit because she actually got Chessex to do the first time they ever paid anyone in advance to do the, some of the third edition supplements. I did... Um, the, she, originally, she wanted to have a game pack. I did the correction thing called the Shalari Companion, trying to explain the problems from the third edition. And a Shalari is, is basically Game Master. In the, it is a Game Master. It actually means the highest teacher, Shalari. And there's, that's one of the things that people got into the game for was the language. You said you'd gone to Tecamel. Andrew said the funniest moment he had was someone coming to him at Gen Con complaining that the language in Jeroon was too hard to understand. And under his arm, he had just bought a Tecumel language guide. <laughs> and I give, I give a lot of credit to Barker because when he did Tecumel, he wasn't doing everything based on European fantasy. He was going into the new world and it was very, very, you know, Mesoamerican feel to it. And his aliens were good aliens and just, they were alien. That was nice. And he yeah, built well, everything you know, by Tolkien. That's one of the things that I really, you know, I'm am, am, uh, sort of teasing out with the, this particular series, you know, was that uh, uh, Tecumel has a foundation um, that, uh, you know, is, is collecting all kinds of things on it. Um, but, the, you know, again, the Tecumel was a very, very non-Western European uh, world. Arduin was out of this world. Uh, yeah. And, uh, um, and, and, and now I want to, to talk to you guys about Jorun because it's also uh, one of those non-Western European uh, worlds, and yeah. um, uh, and and I and I think it's 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 really worthwhile to um, you know people are sort of working on that on 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 bridging that uh, that boundary of fantasy mm -hmm. again, but I think it was bridged very easily back in the old days simply because there wasn't. Um, you know, the Western European thing really hadn't been established. Tolkien was one of several sources. Mm -hmm. um, that, well, Rune uh, itself was also another one from around the same era. That right. Was, um, which, yeah, that, actually, that word didn't come across clearly. Which which one was it? Your Rune Quest was Rune Quest, another, right. another non-Western, you know, Bronze Age sort of uh, setting that was from around the same era as well. And it yeah. had a talent pool that was as strong as, you know, anybody else's. Yeah, yeah. Well, it all came down to the verisimilitude of the settings, you know, because they were so rich, you know, with, with, with Glorantha and Jeroen, they both, they, they seemed lived in in that sort of Tolkien-esque kind of right. way, you know, um, where it, it, the cultures, they aren't like, you know, cultures that are anything from Earth in order to become a citizenship is huge on Jeroen. You know, for example, and the process of becoming a citizen uh, is involved. You have to take uh, what, what's it? Uh, the the and it, yeah, you have to have a uh, chalice, which is the chalice is the disc on which you get the sponsor's signatures, and the thing you're going for is Tother to become yeah, a Tother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't you don't need to uh, that. You don't have to have a campaign set up around that at all. I mean, there's plenty of other things going on in the world that uh, the Game Master can choose to focus on. But with that kind of backdrop, uh, you know, and, and all the, um, the detail that's gone into the various races and their characteristics, it really is like, it real, really feels, you know, lived in, it's very rich. When I got involved with third edition, one of the things that we had set up was to expand beyond the original base. He's talking about the citizenship of a country called Burdoth. Yes. That is that is the dominant culture right now because they 
they found a lot of the old technology from Earth colony in these cryo bins that had been frozen for over 3,000 years, and suddenly it was available to them. And getting a hold of Earth tech is part of the game and part of the world. But you have other places where to become Tother was to willingly make yourself subservient. And, yes. and there are places like, uh, there's a country called Tanthir, where if you are a Tother and you're running around with one of these things to get autographed by all the important citizens, you hide it because if you're caught with it, you terrible things could happen to you. You have other countries like um, Herodoth, which is across the bay from Birdoth, or Jasp, which is much more like a Scandinavian culture, where they don't like the idea of Tother at all. That just means that you're part of one of their biggest competitors. And when I got in there, we would we made an agreement that we would do one thing inside Birdoth and one thing outside Birdoth. So we did, uh, the first thing was JASP in, um, what's it called, Flight of the Alon Star. And then the, we did inside Birdoth with the Soviet Atlas, which is their big desert farming area. Mm -hmm. And then we did outside with Gyre of Silipus, which is where the pirates live. And when I did my stuff independently, I did uh, Thoneport and a lot of stuff in Shalari magazine to explore the rest of the world because it's a huge world. It's and like it's saying, also, go ahead. I was going to say, it, uh, one of the things that struck me as well was a sort of an interesting combination of, of science fiction and fantasy. You know, yeah. because you have, you know, when I, when I first uh, opened the box, I'd, I'd mainly been playing D and D um, in Gamma World, and this has seemed, in some ways, almost. You know, I don't want to go there and say it was a combination of both, but there is sort of a uh, an almost mystical power, more along the lines of you know energy than than magic. In, He's discussing in, 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 Isho. Isho, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, it's based upon the moons and how the moons interact with these crystals that are in the. Uh, in the earth and you can use it to control the mass of an object or, you know, create bend light, um, even, you know, step through space and teleport essentially, you know, you can burn things with it. Uh, and, uh, the, the, it's, it's, I, I've heard that Andrew gets upset when people try to liken it to a magic system because it's yeah. not really a magic system. He it's, wanted, he wanted own. each show to be more of a natural, force of nature yeah. and the things he and I worked out as we were doing our discussions was Jeroen is much more dense in silicon rather than iron and it's much younger than earth so it has a very violent active magnetic field that's interacting with all these crystals and he tried to set everything up on some kind of a uh, physiological nature of the planet rather than magic you don't say the magic words in Jeroen and Isho happens you have to be the right type of person that controls the right kind of Isho that does the right foundation things to make it flow. And there are also items um, from the, the, the Shanta that yes. allow you to uh, channel it. Which yeah. is the Shanta are the native race. And for them, using Isho is like us using a stick to hit a rat. It's just natural. You just pick it up and do it. They mm -hmm. don't have to explain it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I was going to say, you know, a lot of the life forms that have evolved on on Jeroen have have evolved eyelessly. They have no, they have no eyes, and that's because they um, can sense the Isho and use it as a sort of a three hundred and sixty uh, degree perception. They can they can feel it flowing around them and use it as uh, you know sen a, a sense. It's even stronger than vision. And they can also do the same thing of manipulating it so they can mask their own presence mm -hmm. from anyone else that can detect them or uh, shift it and do a mask that is makes them look like a small, harmless woodland creature rather than an armed party of the natives that are trying to get you off their sacred land. Hey, Joe, you there? I'm yeah, here. Oh, okay. It, oh. it sounded like something broke up there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But I was just saying that the, the Shanta have abilities that are beyond what humans and the other races can even understand because it's so innate to their life. Yeah. But by the same token, we don't have a lot of interaction with them because the Shanta learn to live underground. 
because the top of Druun has monsters, and if anything gamers like, it's having big monsters to go after. Oh yeah, <laughs> and they and Jeroen's got them. <laughs> yes, it does. Now let's talk a, a little bit about the inhabitants of Jeroen, because um, you we we did mention right at the very beginning that uh, what happened is that you've got your uh, your your native species, but then on top of that, there's been a uh, the several waves of alien uh, colonization, and humanity is the last one to show up. What are those um, very? What are those various species that are already there? It's not just humanity. The humanity. There is also um, mutated, or I should say, uh, uplifted animals that have um, been biogenetically sort of bred. Yeah, uh, you, you have four basic phases of the life forms on Jeroen. There's the natives, which Steve said they don't need eyes, so they don't have eyes. Mm -hmm. The ones that came a thousand years before humans, there was a race that is only now starting to be talked about, and that's because I can't stop talking about them, called the <laughs> Lamori. And the Lamori brought the other aliens as their slaves or partners or servants, Okay, depending on how you see them. But when the Lamori were actually thrown off of the planet, the Chantha got together. Lamori thought they had conquered the planet. It takes the Chantha a while to decide something. 80 years after they had been conquered, they threw the Lamori off and shot a couple of their ships out of orbit. And no one knew they could do that. So the Lamori are gone, but they left uh, a group called the Thriddle, who are scholars, very mousy, shy, hide and, hide and survive. Uh, archivist. They gather everything they can gather. And it was a thriddle that showed up in Dragon Magazine in some of the advertisements oh, yeah. for the game that were more uh, almost telling a story of a, of a thriddle, right? Yeah. Um, Salro Gomo is the thriddle that shows up in those stories, and he's telling a story to a kid. They were going to do a kid's book mm -hmm. with uh, the thriddle, which I thought would have been great, but they didn't yeah. get around to getting to do it. But uh, you have the Thriddle, you have the Ramion, who are the large blue warriors that go I crazy. Like those guys. Yeah, they're, they're the ones that don't show up within the Isha spectrum. So they're they're essentially invisible to. to well, they're not invisible to it, but they're they can't manipulate Isho, but they are very susceptible to the blue Isho called Shawl, because it drives them crazy. People thought it was their mating bloodlust, but no, they go crazy in the presence of Shawl. And they cannot be negotiated with. They just become war monsters. Uh, then there's a large uh, insectoid race called the Cleish, who can actually manufacture their own weapons out of their bodies by perverting their eggs within their body and turning them into devices that do different things like blow up. Uh, Cleish are not fun to be around and they in turn have their servant race called the Skirmus that kind of look like praying mantises. The Cliche were the partner of the Lamori and the Skirmus were their servants. The Lamori had the Ramion and the Thriddle plus two kind of reptilian races, uh, the Coruscant and the Croyd to serve them. When the Lamori were thrown off, all those other races stayed here and made their homes. And now, then, go ahead. You, so you talked about the the blue e show. Is that related now? Now Jorun is known also as the uh, the world of the seven moons, right? So is there an, an is is that related? Is that part of exactly. how the e show? Exactly. Each moon dominates a spectrum. Uh, one of the colors of what we call uh, e show, they call show Kadal, which is the entire network of moons power and the planet they call that the the breathing planet shokadal and there are seven colors and each color dominates a certain area for example the yellowy show controls levitation and gravity that's where the sky realms come from they form naturally they levitate naturally mm -hmm. uh greeny show is about life force you can heal someone you can make them really sick too uh, Bluey show is neural energy, thought, brains, you know, those kind of uh, uh, vibrations. And that's the uh, one that affects the, uh, the Ramions. Right. Blacky show or brownie show is uh, Gobi, which is used in construction. It's the manipulation of physical objects using Esho. So the builders all use Blacky show. 
And then you have Whitey Show, which is unique to Jeroen of anywhere because it can actually open warps between mated positions on the planet. If you open a warp in one location, it will always go to this other location. So you better know where you're opening a warp. And uh, or you're going to get get lots, or, or it's it's cliche all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> it's turtles all the way down. Yes. Uh, and then you have Red Isho, which is heat and uh, fire energies. So that's used in more of the war combat. That was the Isho that was used against Lomori to get them off the planet. Um, you have Orange Isho, which is simple illumination. You can make a little sphere of Isho over your head to follow you around, and it's like having a miner's helmet. You have light wherever you want to look. It also means you're easy to spot in the dark. Um, Steve, what have I left off? White, red, yellow, green, wow. blue, uh, black. It's a quiz. Steve wasn't expecting a quiz. <laughs> uh, it's funny because it's, I've, I've unfortunately had to put down Jerome for the last few months. And, um, yeah. I, uh, I'm trying to think. I, I've only named six, and there's 70 shows. But um, And I mentioned green. I mentioned the healing. You'll wake up at two o'clock in the morning. So of course, yeah, then I'll remember. remember. <laughs> <laughs> then my brand will keep me up until then. Yeah. Um, um, I'm actually flipping for a book right now because it's bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any of my books nearby. I have electronic copies on the computer, but so let me. Um, and I'm I'm sure we will come back to some of the mechanics of the of what makes the world work because that's really the. Uh, one of the most interesting things to talk about, but let me again sort of establish a little bit of history. So Joe, you started working um, with Chessex on writing the supplements to the third edition of Jorun, but you've basically had your hands in it um, for a couple of decades. What went on um, uh, later in that period of time and then the return to Jorun uh, website? Um when I was brought on, I was I was doing uh, maps, illustration, and layout, and I was doing writing for three of five supplements we had planned. And then in the third supplement, the guy of Syllabus, they fired the editor I had been working with. They hired someone else to be an editor, and she published a map in Guy of Syllabus where she used an old version of the map that didn't have any street names. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, the leakers pulled the contract from uh, Chessex and blocked any further publication. Okay. And since then, they've had some stuff going with the family that Jeroen's now in the middle of that I don't expect Jeroen ever to be released in a, in a formal fourth edition. What Steve is doing is the most promising thing for the planet that has happened <laughs> in a long time. As on a fan level or... I consider myself the M appeal of Jeroen. I'm a dead, I'm a talented amateur. Okay. Okay. And I did Shalari magazine, stayed in touch with Jeroenies all over the world through AOL. Mm -hmm. And then when a guy in England started publishing Borkleby's Folly, uh, I was there for him and we collaborated on some material there. Uh, there was another fanzine that was done online called Danstead Traveler back in 2001 and 2002. And there's a guy named Shalari James in Sweden who has been issuing volume after volume after volume of Jeroen material that he's written, mm -hmm. um, all of which is amazing, all of which can be found on archive.org for free. People can just download them. Mm -hmm. But um, there was a huge body of work developed to support the world. And people love the world. They love going there. You may know about Earth. You may know about the United States and Russia and nuclear weapons and space stations. But meanwhile, in Glendale, California, there's a guy trying to get to work in a bus strike. Mm -hmm. And there's that scope of stories. You have these gigantic world-changing stories and little personal challenges and victories that you can have all the way down the line. And people always wrote their own version. We have guys at Cambridge in uh, England that came up with hundreds of pages for a story of Herodoth because they were playing a play-by-mail game. And they weren't playing characters. They were playing city-states. 
So someone was actually playing this, you know, these cities of Mird and the cities of York and the cities, all these others. They played cities and what did they do and how were their populations doing and were they trying to conquer each other? And it was a fascinating thing. Now, this is all you're talking about. All of this is happening uh, after the actual commercial publication of the game has already ceased. Do you think that that was something that freed people up? Well, actually, the uh, Cambridge group and there was another fanzine called uh, Sarkin's Knowledge that were between second and third editions. Okay. And I was publishing Shalori Magazine while the commercial Jeroen was still being published. Um, Borkelsby's Folly and Dance at Traveler were after the contract had been pulled and there was just fans doing what they wanted to do. And then Return to Jeroen was just my own thing. That came later in the you know 2008 is when I think I started that one, but um, it did free a lot of people, but it also made a lot of people mad because there were a lot of people that wanted the commercial license for a fourth edition, and they didn't get it, and they were angry that I was still publishing things, and Andrew was one of my contributors. Andrew Leaker contributed a great deal to what I did. Uh -huh. And Miles Teves turned around and sent me this huge package of art, including some stuff that was never published that he just said, oh, well, maybe you can use some of this. Uh, yeah. And, you know, there was there was support from the creators, support from the fans, the support from the other publishers. And it was amazing to watch it stay alive all those years. Mm -hmm. and, I, I wanna, can I add something? Absolutely. Sure. Go I actually, I, I'm still hopeful. I mean, granted, yeah, it may, it may be slim, but I am hopeful of it actually becoming, you know, something more than just fan, uh, you know, fan based. I, I think it has potential, uh, and the world really deserves to be, you know, shared in the proper light. And I'm, I'm, I mean, if if any revamping is done, and it doesn't, um, you know, go, for, go further than being a fan based thing, that's fine for sure. But I, I think that there's actually, you know, potential for it to to be taken to you know a more a professional level actually i think what you're doing with the d20 is the most hopeful we have a friend of mine has a 14 year old son who's into fifth edition D, &D mm -hmm. and he does his own podcast on jeroon or whatever you want to call the, the the youtube channel cast and when he found out about jeroon he got very excited then I told him that there was the possibility of a D20 version from D&D. &D. He got even more excited. He's had me on two of his podcasts to talk about what old farts think of modern D&D. &D. <laughs> so nice, I, yeah. I'm the resident old fart, apparently. <laughs> and uh, But he's really excited at the idea that he might be able to get into Jeroen using the mechanics he knows. So I think Steve may be on the verge of a breakthrough with Jeroen just finding its audience. And yeah, uh, I think that's more the issue. It's 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 a world that is only remembered, you know, by us because it's very cool. But it, it, there aren't a lot of people who are really very familiar with it, you know, because it's 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 it's, it's almost an unknown. It's a mystery, you know. It, it doesn't get a lot of, uh, you know. I was. I mean, we're talking about worlds that have been, in many ways, you know, almost lost. Uh, to the gaming community, you know, Tecamel as well really yeah. is not is right. not well known. Arduin is essentially not known, you right. know, outside of the community of people who were gaming at uh, at the time. And um, you know, Jorun probably pretty much in the same uh, position as Tecamel, maybe yeah. even maybe even not as well known as Tecamel. Um, yeah. But uh, but I mean, how how is it that you guys would be talking about? Um, I mean, wouldn't you need a license to use the the name Jorun or? Well, uh, I've actually already gotten the go ahead, the semi verbal go ahead from from Miles, to, okay. and I've been in correspondence with with Andrew, and I'm I'm convinced that if if the rules can recreate their original ver vision of it, uh, and I know they can, um, especially using the the die twenty or SRD, mm -hmm. I, I think. Um, I, I think that they'll they'll be the one to start playing again themselves, you know, because the, it's the, the 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 game mechanics can accomplish anything, you know, if you if you just put it together early, right? With that, with that SRD, in my in my opinion. 
So. I want to I want to say something too, and that is what Steve is doing is an outreach to the modern audience, and us old farts. And I think I'm the oldest one on this feed right here, but we actually you have no idea how rare it is for someone to say that to my face that they're <laughs> older than i because everybody that i have on this is younger than me so it's real really gratifying to i'm to, 68 to have you say that yeah i'm no, 68 how old are you you're at you're oh you're way ahead of me i'm, uh, I'm <laughs> i think i I'm, saw the look of horror that crossed your face I, I, i'm like 52 i think okay okay yeah, I'm, I'm 52 but, as well actually and yeah, and it was a very strange thing that I got involved because I didn't get to start playing games until I was 42 years old. I tried to play Traveler before that, and every time I generated a character, they died. In first edition, <laughs> everybody I know knows in first edition Traveler, you could die. And then years later, when I finally got into playing with RuneQuest and Jeroen and D&D, &D, people said, well, why didn't you just lie and say they didn't die? And it had never occurred to me to buy the rules so I could <laughs> not follow them. I was trying to learn what the rules were still. So, but anyway, uh, I just fell into this at the right time, the right place. Uh, we had a kid that worked at the Burger King in my office building. I worked for the state of California in Berkeley. And I would go down to Burger King for my lunch and go back up. And I was doing radio drama at the time. And I had just done some material for a series called Free Space. And I had done a resource, what we would now call, what I would now call a source book, mm -hmm. but it was for the free space people, the actors and the writers to know about the world and where we were going. And we recorded a pilot episode and we were trying to get the funding to go on and do it as a series. And I showed the kid the, um, the basic Bible for free space. And he said, have you ever played a role playing game? And I explained to him about Traveler and all that. And he said, oh, you're going to love role playing. So a kid half my age got me into my first games. And the biggest tragedy of being 68 is no one will come out to play. Yeah. I can't get a group together anymore, and it drives me nuts. But what the difference is between that generation and the generation that's coming up with the new fifth edition is our generation were the living embodiment of McLuhan's mess medium is the message. The very reason people got involved in role-playing games is because it – triggered their imagination they did not just roll dice to see how well they were rolling they rolled dice to see if they successfully jumped from one side of the chasm to the other without dropping their weapon they could they rolled to see whether or not they could kill the monster they rolled to see whether or not they would escape alive their mind filled in all of the detail the pictures the equipment what everything looked like what the, they even did their own music in their own heads you know, did you ever have a thing where you suddenly realize, oh, I was running a theme music behind me while I was doing that scene. But our imagination was active and involved. And most of the modern generation, I hate to sound like an old fart, but the modern generation is used to having everything handed to them that here's the picture, here's the image, here's the movie, here's the game, this is what you can do. I avoided getting into computer games because my experience was, one, they were based on nightmares. The monsters came after you until they killed you, and then you had to get a new life. Or you had to do what the writer had come up with. The programmer would come up with what was allowed in the game. And if you did something that could have completely changed the game and won, but it wasn't what the programmer had thought of, it broke the game. And you got, you know, you froze or you had to restart. And it's a very different market now, and I just don't have a grip on that market, and I think Steve does. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I do think that one of the things, one of the attractions to, to people this, you know, of, of this generation of gamers is, I mean, they are so plugged in, and uh, this is an opportunity to not be plugged in, you know, and actually sit around a table, throw some dice, eat some yeah. dice. And you know, just, just have a good social, you know, time. Human, you know, human with humans. Yeah, you know. that's what I miss, man. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and that's one of the attractions. I mean, I don't. I'm not a big game fan myself. You know, I don't I have a huge collection of board games, but but the like you said, uh, the the freedom of having your imagination completely, you know, open and you know, available to explore in any direction is, you know, theater enough for me, you know, and make that social and it's awesome. You know, it's just you know, one of the best things you can do, I think, as far as entertainment goes. Um, 
So I don't think that's going to go away. I think I think that you know people will continue to work on their you know their holographic you know miniature you know sets and you know ways of like plugging in virtually so that you know even you know we could have a game for example with Skype or something. And that's well, the there's, an, there's an awful lot of that yeah. that is going on. Is that um, and, and in fact I I run two of them myself. Is just online uh, gaming people who aren't in the same room necessarily but they're playing the unstructured role-playing games uh you know as opposed to the uh um the uh modules well i you know as, as opposed to modules or even going further as opposed to playing you know uh basically video games uh, right. you know or games that are highly advanced video games like you know skyrim or or you know um dragon souls things like that um that that are more constrained by the media that they're yeah. In, but I think that the younger generation has, uh, uh, they've got a lot of choices. It's a board game. There's a, an enormous board game renaissance going on yeah. um, at, at the moment. And then also, you know, like I said, fifth edition D and D, which, you know, it does have more rules than a lot of the, um, uh, than the games that were, that were played before. So there is to some degree, the issue of, um, you know, whether you're going to make it, you know, whether you're going to make it across the chasm, you know, or, or so on. But I, I do actually think that the, uh, the, the younger generation, um, that's sort of coming up now, you know, the, the folks that are in their early to late twenties, um, they, they are a gaming generation. It's just that they're a little different than our gaming generation that we all, you know, jumped into. Um, and so I don't think we necessarily see some of the subtleties that are involved, but they are actually, um, very much a gaming generation. Yeah. One of the things I think that will save it is that the thing that I think can be killed is storytelling. People love to tell stories. They love to hear stories. And gaming gives you a chance to experience the story as it happens. And that, to me, is just beyond value. I mean, you can't put a price on it. It's magic. It is real magic. Oh, yeah. And, and, and role-playing games are basically... Um, I, it had, you know, it had existed before, but it's basically the sort of uh, interactive storytelling with a few rules. I mean, that was a new thing. That was a new way. It wasn't a new sort of story, but it was a new way of telling it. Yeah. Yeah. And also you were improving with other creative people. You get together with a good gaming session. You improved an entire novel in one evening with your friends telling bad Monty Python jokes and having oh, soda, yeah. and, and soda and Cheetos. <laughs> but uh, it was an experience that when you left, you're, you were left with the memory of the scenes you created. And those scenes were absolutely perfect for your imagination. Everyone left that game with their own version of what it looked like. So, let's, just, so let's say I'm 25 or 35 which you know, unfortunately, I'm not anymore. But uh, you know, let's 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 say that I'm uh, not from the um, kids with bikes, Stranger Things generation. I'm from one of the younger generations. What might make me want to um, pick up third edition Jorun, second edition Jorun, um, and and start playing it either with the Jorun rules or hacking my own system of fifth edition or D twenty or whatever uh, I use to interpret it. What might make me uh, want to do that? Well, if you're a fan of Barsoom, that sort of uh, you know fantasy uh, science fiction, I should actually let the Joe here speak because he's a. Uh... Oh, uh, you were doing fine. Okay. To me, to me, the reason people get involved is the thrill of discovering something new and exciting and discovering you can do things you never dreamed you could do before. Like he said, Barsoom, I was trying to get someone to read John Carter of Mars like about five years ago. And I first read it in 1964. And I still remember the scene where John Carter encounters Tars Tarkaz for the first time. And Tarkaz is so fascinated with the way John Carter jumps. And he just keeps telling him, sock, sock, mm -hmm. which is jump, jump. And I told it to the guy, and he said the way I told it to him got him so involved, he went out and bought the first 10 books. <laughs> it's like, aha, I got another one, you know? I've, and I've heard that described by somebody as uh, jamais vu. 
In other words, it's like deja vu, only you've never, you know, you've never run across anything like this ever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I like that. I like first sight. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, you know, there's, you know, that, that kind of thing is, is, is rare, um, that, that you can run across something like that. And, uh, you know, with gaming, it's interactive. And so, you know, again, that's, you know, Tecumel, Arduin, you know, uh, Jorun, um, that, that you've got, um, a, a, a sort of prepared area that is not constraining that you can just mentally get into that is still very different from anything that you've seen before. Yeah, and with, with details that inspire your imagination and, and ways that you would normally, you know, go to because things are set up, the paradigm's different, you know, it's not a medieval village. It's, you know, it's a place, you know, where it's important to find, I, there's some kind of a combination of of minerals and, and vitamins and stuff that people have to use, humans have to use to, to eat, you know, normal food still, if I recall, right, Joe? Well, that I have a whole other take on Duralig, which he's talking about Duralig, which is the root all creatures from Earth must eat in order to metabolize food. Uh -huh. And to me, after 3,500 years, I think we would have eliminated all the ones that couldn't metabolize. Because, you know, when you die, you don't breed much. Yeah, <laughs> so... Uh uh, that's very much a part of the original thing. I think that was part of the teenage thing of the teenage boys that were doing Jeroen. And it was just so cool to have something that you had to force people to eat. And 3,500 <laughs> years later, they're still going, oh, yuck. You know, it's like <laughs> Brussels sprouts of all nations. I mean, you know, it was fun. And to me, I just never made that part of my, my Jeroen because I made it my own. And I yeah. like the idea that you don't have to worry about whether or not you got the giant carrot on your plate. Although Brussels sprouts are definitely part of the universal teenager experience. Yeah, yeah, I didn't like them until I was in my 20s. Stir-fried Brussels sprouts with chicken are a whole other animal. They're just yeah. great. They're yeah. great. But when I was a teenager, no damn way. <laughs> and the only reason I liked artichokes is because this girl I knew liked artichokes. If she liked artichokes, I liked artichokes. There, there's, there, there is that pattern of events that, that takes place. <laughs> yeah. And uh, right. Jeroen is the same story always with the kids. They want to find out what it's like to have power, to not be the junior, weaker person in the in the group. They want to get laid. They want to get the treasure. They want to be good guys. They want to win. And something a, a gaming offers is a place to go and win. And a lot of teenagers don't get that much. Yeah. No. God, no. Um all right, so um, we're we're starting to run close to the time um, that we normally end one of these. So let me ask you guys um, about things that you're working on right now. Steve, let me start with you, and then I'll wrap up with Joe. So you mean related to Jerome? Yeah. Or what are you general? Um, either, 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 both. Oh, okay. Well, the, there is the Jerome project, which I said that Nessa's already kind of um, spoken about a little bit. But uh, I'm, I'm currently just working freelance writing uh, in the video game industry, actually. So uh, that's kind of taking a lot of my time and unfortunately distracting me from the, you know, the stuff that's you know, the real, the real, uh, you know, labors of love. Well, um, what he's also left off is he has a couple of kids, a couple of albums out with his group. Uh, Steve does a lot of stuff and he's a very fine artist. Oh, Three-dimensional, two-dimensional, line, painting, <laughs> just, he, do, he can do that. So a renaissance man, what's the name of your group? Uh, drop the Black Sky, actually. <laughs> drop drop the Black Sky? or No, Drop Black, as in the, the hue of uh, black that's made from uh, grapes. Drop can Black I, Sky. Let me get you uh, to email me uh, a, a link to some stuff on the band and we'll put that down in the description of the video for people to click on. Okay. Very well. Couldn't hurt. Yeah. Well, people like, people like more depth, you know, <laughs> anytime that you're on, uh, you know, listening to, to people talking, they, they want to know, or at least have the option to know more about, you know, someone's life. So that's, no, okay. I, I figured it wasn't game related, but I'm fine sharing it. It's uh, we just recently actually, 
uh, submitted us two two a uh, two mixes of a, one song that are both going into the finals of the uh, international songwriting competition. So, uh, all right, yeah, yeah. So at least somebody's listening. You know, people like it. <laughs> And apparently he's a good dad too, because his kids are still alive and kicking and showing up on Facebook being uh, kids. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, they're they're doing well, um, and 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 interested in role playing games themselves. I mean, if you saw downstairs, uh, you'd see the room of shame, which is filled with much, <laughs> you know, gothic cities, three feet tall, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, lots of figures and whatnot. So and it's, like, it's like Einstein said, if you want your kids to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Joe, um, what is it? Uh, what is it that you're working on right now? I'm working on a couple of non uh fiction projects. I've been asked to do one for ADOM, which is a German role playing game. That's a computer game and it's now evolving into a pencil, paper and dice game. And I've been asked to do some writing for that. I've got a number of things out on Amazon. I was a playwright in LA. Uh, I worked at the Deja Vu Theater. I was the playwright in residence there for a while. Um, five of my plays are available now. I have a science fiction novel called The Song of Orphans that's been out for a little while. It's about to get a new push. And I have a non-genre novel called Climbing the Spiral Mountain, which... Uh, is the proudest thing I've ever done. I am the most proud of that than anything. And I've done a lot of stuff, but uh, I'm focusing on trying to bowing out as a writer. Uh, I'm going to have to leave the Jeroen stuff because I cannot type the way I used to type. Uh, I have physical problems with neurology and some other things that are definitely getting in the way. So rather than be even worse than I already have been with typos and publishing embarrassing things, I'm going to stop. And I have a couple of projects for Jeroen that should be out in the next, there's four projects that should be out over the next 18 months and then I'll probably just leave everything to Steve and the people that follow the new thing he's doing. And there's some way of, is there still a way of subscribing to the things that you are uh, writing or is it just something that you that people will have to buy in the in an, an aftermarket of some kind? Um, I can send you the links for the Jeroen related stuff, including okay. the stuff you can get free online from archive.org. And I'll send you the links to Amazon for, you know, my other stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. The Spiral Mountain. Yeah. Cause uh, you know, there, there will have, having heard that it's the thing you're proudest of there, there probably will be a few people who will go and take uh, a look at climbing the spiral uh, mountain. So that would be nice. I would like that. Uh, I think it leaves you with a good feeling and a lesson that, um, uh, not people not all people get to hear and if you're going to write a book the thing you have to know is what is the message you want to say in Jeroen I wanted to say you can go places and win you can discover new things and not be plowed under and with my fiction I try to do that all the way through I have I have four books that I'm working on at the same time I never work on one thing at a time I juggle and suddenly a lot of things come out and uh Right now, I've got the last issue of Segment Show Cut All, which is a Jeroen newsletter I did online for the past year. Number 12 is about to come out. And there's a 13 and 14 planned, but I'm not in a rush or press to do those. Uh, number 12 should be out in the next 30 days. And then um, after that, I'll be working on some of my other fiction. I've got a thing called More Than This, which is my science fiction look at a future that I kind of hope doesn't happen, but if it had to happen, we could probably survive it. <clears throat> All right. Other than, other than that, I don't do much. <laughs> I, I, did want to, I did want to add one thing, though, actually, which might be relevant. Um, the, the game system that I've created to uh, simulate the Jeroen, you know, to, to, to use in the Jeroen setting um, is, like I, like I said, it's based on the Die 20 Hero SRD, but it's also based on some of the other ones. And so it's, it's what, I'm, what I'm creating is sort of like a, uh, a free uh, Die 20 version of like GURPS or uh, Hero System champions that can be applied to any sort of genre. Mm -hmm. And I'll send you a link to that too, because um, 
people may be interested and may want to get involved. And, and do we uh, dare say it? Do we dare say its name? ID twenty. It would be imagined I twenty, but it is ID twenty as opposed to D twenty. I've always been calling it ID twenty. It's okay. It doesn't <laughs> matter. I didn't but, uh, know. When I when I stumbled upon that SRD, it was like for me it was a, a dream come true because I've always had issues with level based uh, uh, role playing games. I, I prefer games that you know don't encourage that type of play, and um, I it's it's right there. It's all there in the in the rules. You can pretty much recreate. Well, you know, I, I have links that people can check out, but. It's essentially, you know, mutants and masterminds with hit points. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, it's, I, I think, you know, the cool thing about the SRDs is that they're all out there and they're all free. Um, so, because you know, you'd, pr you'd pretty much, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the, e the way at least that e show sounds like it's manipulated, you would almost have to follow um, one of the, superhero type systems in order to exactly. build out seven different yeah, very much you, that flavor you would need to you would need to do something like a like a, a point pool very a variation pool where you can just uh have a certain amount of points to recreate any kind of effect you know that's limited to say uh well what is is tra, tra is white right so you, 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 white, you, yeah. you, like, depending upon yes you know, so, or if you had red it would be you, know, you could do heat um, but any kind of heat-based thing, like create a fire or, you know, and, you know, throw a bolt at somebody, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, with the with this type of rule system, you can make that up on the spot. It's not like you have to pre-plan on having that spell. If you understand the rules, you can just right. you know, combine this element with this element and bam, you know, so a lot more freedom. Put it in the same category as learning to sing. Once you learn to sing, you can do Marty Robbins or you can do an aria, you know, a good operatic aria. So it depends on what your training is, what your initial genetic ability to manipulate the skill of the sound, and let's, then let's not, your goal. Let's not forget Johnny Rotten. With that. <laughs> you could do that too. <laughs> you could do that too. All you have to do is defy all your training and your genetics. <laughs> the, well, of course, there's the Johnny Rotten operas. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, which are usually at 3 a.m. in New York alleys when the cats knock over the can. All right. So um, anything, any other last uh, thoughts before we wrap it up, guys? Either one? I kind of hope that we're seeing a renaissance of imagination where people realize that they don't have to be consumers of imagination. They can get uh, some elements and create create people they care about in a place they care about where they get the narrative and they have the control. And I want them to enjoy that moment when you've successfully created something. It's like, think of the games you've played where at the end you did it right. And you just come away like going, no one could have done that better. Yeah. You're sort of like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want to see a resurrection of that. And that's what I think that, you know, Steve's project is moving toward a resurrection of the sense of triumph out of gaming. Then, Oh yeah. I was reading Nietzsche tonight and he was said that when people lose their ability to have heroes, they require no one else to have heroes either. Mm -hmm. And we need to be a race of heroes again. All right, everybody. Well, thank you guys so much for being on the show. And uh, so uh, this was very pleasant. Thank oh. you. You're you're very welcome. Um, so say say good night uh, to your fans. Y'all need <laughs> to send me your, uh, your the links to all of the stuff that we mentioned in the video, um, and then they'll they'll be hot linked in the description underneath. Um, and I will say to everybody um, that uh, no matter what kind of Dungeons and Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.